good to be with you here on this last Sunday of July. And on the last Sunday of the month, it is our tradition to wish a happy birthday to everyone. So I'm going to wish a happy birthday to Dora and Gay and Jeannie and Jim and Jay and Rob and Scott and Jim and Sandy and Dorothy and Dawn and Debbie and Mike. They all have birthdays coming up in the month of August. Uh, so we wish you a happy birthday and that God will bless you in very special ways during this strange and exciting time. But it is a wonderful time to have a birthday too. Will you pray with me? Oh gracious God, we ask that you reveal yourself in special ways today. That you flow through our songs, our words, our silence and our music. So that all of us can sense your presence and know that you are with us in all times. May all that we say and do glorify you, O Lord. Through Christ we pray, amen. And may the peace of Christ fill your hearts and minds always. The peace of Christ to you, Cameron. Thank you. The peace of Christ to you, Bart. Thank you so much. Let's continue our worship by singing hymn number 275, that great hymn of the Reformation, a mighty fortress is our God, and we'll sing the verses 1 and 2. and our God is a mighty fortress. It's time for our children's sermon. And when I look in our Love Rules box, I have a picture of John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis died last week, a man of wonder, a man of incredible strength and power and wisdom, a man who made a difference in our country, a man who inspires us to continue making a difference so that all people are treated equally. So children, this is something I want you to remember about him. In all of his greatness, he was also a humble man, a man of integrity. One time someone asked him, sir, you've been through so much, you've been hurt, you've been beaten as you walk for civil rights, you've been abused verbally, all these things, and yet you seem to continue to go on, you have a great spirit within you. And he said, you have to protect the joy within you. 
I'm asking you children, protect that joy within you because we adults need your joy, your giggles, your laughter, your questions. We need you. You help us remember our own joy. I hope that God is blessing you in special ways, Lord. You are in my, my prayers each day, all of you children. So blessings to you. Have you ever wondered how letters were delivered in biblical times? After all, the Bible has an entire section written to believers of letters written to believers living in various regions. Military and other governmental information was delivered by special courier. However, there did not exist a system for regular people to send letters. So people like Paul would pay travelers to carry it and deliver their mail, and it was expensive to do so. It is estimated that it cost Paul $2,000 of today's currency to send this more than 7,000 word letter to the believers in Rome from the place he was, which was around Corinth, and that was about 600 miles. The average letter of that day was about 87 words. So you can imagine that these letters of the Bible would stand out as unusually long. Their content often contains some personal information, but are mostly instructive and a witness to Christ. The Christians in Rome, in Rome at the time of Paul's letter, which was written about 55 AD, were going through a time of adaptation and adjustment. You see, in AD 49, all the prominent Jewish Christian leaders and a lot of the members were expelled from Rome. They were allowed to come back to Rome five years later, bringing with them believers that were new to the area. Among them were Gentile believers. And so Paul often speaks of Jews and Gentiles throughout the letter, addressing some of the debates that he heard had arisen among the believers in Rome. Paul was writing to a group of believers in Rome who had for the most part absorbed the Greek language and aspects of Greek culture for centuries. Remember your world history when you learned about the Hellenistic culture. This is what we're talking about. Paul masterfully uses the images and techniques of debate throughout his letter to connect with the readers of the time. So we're going to read Romans 8, 26 through 39. It is a passage that teaches us that we have a support in our prayer life, since even the best prayers among us have a long way to go to truly understand how to pray. The passage reinforces Paul's teaching that we have a deep interconnectedness with God. It is a passage that reminds us that God is present and working in all things. Watch for the section which tells us that God foreknew, God predestined, God called, God justified, and God glorified people. Listen well as three questions that begin with who are answered for us. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Christ our Redeemer. Amen. Listen for the word of God speaking to you through these ancient words. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, we need the Spirit's help as we pray so that we are truly praying for the will of God. As try as we might, even when we say the words, thy will be done, or words like that, we hold certain expectations, even conditions, in our hearts. The Spirit takes our prayers and reforms them as they are lifted to God, so that the true depth of need is conveyed, something sometimes beyond our own comprehension. Verse 28. We know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now, I prefer to use the translation that several ancient manuscripts have. 
Those say, we know that God works all things together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now, both translations are accurate. The alternate one, though, however, plainly reminds us that it is God who will work good in everyday, ordinary, as well as the most tragic of situations and conditions. Verse 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, he also glorified. Well, here's that sticky wicket of predestination. You know, I was astounded several years ago at the last church I worked with, um, as I worked with a group of people who were identifying the core values of their church, they told me that younger adults often associate Presbyterian with predestination. That's younger adults. I was astounded. Of all the things that Presbyterians have stood and worked for, predestination is what many look for when they look at church websites or other information. It seems that the doctrine of predestination is troublesome for most folks. And, admittedly, it can be. However, as Paul presents here, and if you boil down all the theological rhetoric about predestination, it simply assures us that God has a plan. The group I was working on uses this as one of their belief statements. Predestination is good news. God has a plan for the world, and it is a plan of love. That is an accurate statement of our belief in predestination and exactly what Paul is talking about in this passage. Now, in this next section, pay attention to the way in which Paul uses some contemporary debate strategy. He makes statements and asks questions, and then he answers them. Notice how he lists things that separate people from one another, from their loved items from whatever, and yet they do not separate us from God. Notice how he declares us victorious, even though we're not finished with the marathon of service. Verse 31, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord for our lives in these days. Claim these words for your life today. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not COVID, not politicizing mask wearing, not differing opinions about police actions or political leaders, not this time of separation from our family and friends. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And if we are abiding in that love, then our bonds as people of the loving God are not separated as well. Nothing can separate us. We are more than conquerors over all these things. For God loves us and God is on our side. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, help us to claim these words fully in our lives. Help them to be words that empower us 
for the ordinary things each day brings to us and for the extraordinary things. Thank you, Lord, for these words of strength, of assurance, of knowing that we are with you and you are with us always. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 846 if you have a hymnal. It's called Fight the Good Fight, and we'll sing the first and the fourth verses. Thank you for the many ways we can connect through technology, through the visits that are seven or eight feet apart on our porches. Thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the world. I ask, Lord, that as we watch or listen or read the news, that you open us to the possibility of prayer with each story. I pray, Lord, for those who are in mourning. Over this last year, Lord, there are many of us that have lost family members or friends. There are many people who have to be separated from their loved ones in the time of the death journey. I pray, Lord, for the health workers, for now there are many places where once again they are overwhelmed. I pray, Lord, for our area, because we've seen a rise of the virus. So, Lord, I ask that you help people recover quickly, but that you also help to instill wisdom in our area. Thank you, God, for all your blessings. I ask that you continue to bless us with this spirit of wanting to know what to do in these times which are ripe for changes to be made so that all people are treated equally, so that we can take away the hate that continues to rise up, O oh Lord. For we know that is not of your making. Gracious Lord, help us all to know what our responsibility is. Help us to be aware of our own actions, thoughts, and words. Gracious Lord, help us to be the people you created us to be, that you call us to be. Help us to know that even as we face all these things that seem overwhelming, that yes, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Gracious Lord, hear our prayers, those that I have said, those that are in our hearts. And hear them, Lord, as we lift them on the wings of the prayer you taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus Christ. May you know that power of Jesus Christ in your lives. May the love of God fill you. May the grace of Jesus Christ surround you. And may the Spirit move you. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Spirit hugs to all of you. pastor of First Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you've chosen to be a part of our services during this time of separation. These are days which are challenging for us, for every one of us. If you need to talk with someone, please know that I am available. I'm in the church office Monday through Thursday from about 8.30 to 3.30. You can call us at 217-345-2335. Please, if there is not an answer, leave a message. I will get back to you as soon as I can. I hope you know that God loves you and that you feel the divine presence in your life. Perhaps when we are all able to get together again, if you have not ever come to this church, that you will come and meet the good folks here. Blessings to you. <laughs>